This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. Hi, I'm here with Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank. Barbara, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Excellent. Well, I'm going to I'm going to dive right in then. Is that okay with you? Yep, yep, yep. So so Barbara, everyone knows you right now, of course, as the Shark Tank lady. Now, I know you also because in New York City, Corcoran Group is everywhere. You I think you rented me the apartment I'm currently in actually, or at least the Corcoran Group did. I wish I had that commission now. I would spend it again. It was probably a good commission too. You guys real estate in New York is crazy, but that's that's for another podcast. But um I want to try to get a little bit more of your background and correct me if I'm wrong or or jump in on anything. So so let me see if I get this right. In school, you weren't always the best student. You were kind of a a D student. You you were a waitress and a guy came in, said you were going to be great at real estate. Uh, and basically offered you a thousand dollars to start your real estate business. Is this more or less accurate? Yeah, it's kind of like the modern day version of Cinderella. You're a Cinderella. That's what I was thinking when I was on my way over here. <laughs> You're right. That's exactly what happened. And and who was this guy? Like how how did he recognize real estate talent in you from from your waitressing skills? Well, the way you told the story was uh, it presented a little faster than it was. He didn't actually walk into the diner and uh, say you'd be great in real estate. That happened about eight months later once we started dating. But he did walk into the diner, and he did offer me a ride home, and that's a fish on the line, right? And then he also, most importantly, suggested that a smart girl like me, I remember I still glow with the words, a smart girl like me from New Jersey at the diner belonged in a city like New York. And it was like, whoa, really? Cool. Cool. And so he offered to pay for five nights at the Barbizon Hotel for women. He explained it was respectable. No men are allowed. Because remember, I was still a virgin, sadly, at that point. And what? Yes. What a waste. Wait. How old were you? 23. Oh, my gosh. Oh, uh, yeah. But remember, I'm ancient now. But it wasn't like I was saving it for anybody. Nobody asked me for it. But he did, eventually. And I moved to New York, and the minute I got to that Father's Own Hotel on Lexington Avenue, I knew I'd never move back to New Jersey. It was done. I was like, yes, I love this place. And then eight months later, I was working as a receptionist answering phones for the Jafuni Brothers, a builder in town, and he said, you be great at real estate with your personality. And that's when he gave me the lucky $1,000. What does he mean by your personality, with your personality? Like, what personality did you have that he saw? Um, it's pretty much what I always had. You know, um, I'm very outgoing. I love people. I mean, you really have to be a murderer for me not to like you. I can usually see the upside or bright side of anybody I meet. Um, I love cajoling. I love talking. I never shut up. I love socializing with people. They're my favorite subject in the world. I'm never bored with it. And so he saw that in the diner. Um, he saw that me bubbling away of how exciting it was to answer phones all day, which wasn't that great, I guess, by other people's standards. But I loved chatting up the tenants I called, uh, sending a plumber to fix the toilet. It was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. You know? And so I think he thought my personality uh, would be good in sales. And uh, he was correct. And it wasn't, you know, a lot of people think sales is about uh, really uh, being aggressive about money. Um I found with myself it had nothing to do with that. It's just I had fun chatting it up and helping people. And it almost seemed more like charity work, the business. And I also found that when I built my company to over a thousand people strong, my superstar salespeople that were making millions of dollars a year in commissions, uh, some of them were money focused. I mean, they all like money, but that's not what made them great. They were just phenomenal hardworking salespeople who really loved what they were doing. The money kind of took care of itself. What do you, what do you think for them is the key to good sales? Like what's what are some characteristics of a good salesperson in general? Uh, well, there's only one that uh, if I were to put all the characteristics that are uh, many, okay, uh, on two hands, there is one that would have the weight of all the others put together, which is the ability to get over failure. And I know that sounds like such a cliche. I hate to say it because everybody says, oh, persistence, persistence. There's a million names for it. 
But I found that the people uh, in my company that were making, say, the top people were making $4 million a year in commissions, four to four and a half maybe, and the average uh, salesperson in my company was making, I think the number was 68000 at the point I sold my business. So how do you, how do you, how do you explain that away? You know, 68000 a year to millions? I mean, what's the thing? But I did hire, train, and fire uh, salespeople my whole life. That's what I did every day of my life. And I found the real difference between uh, the superstars, the amazing ones, and everyone else is they – uh, took all the same rejections, of course, had as many hits, in fact, more because they were trying for more. Uh, but the real difference was uh, how long they took to feel sorry for themselves. And you want to know, uh, I think people always think people who feel sorry for themselves is a verbal thing, like, oh, poor me, oh, poor me. It's not. It's a mental thing. And I could spot a salesman in a mental funk from a mile away. I just had an intuitive sense of nose for it. And they might look like they're in business, making the calls, sitting at the desk, looking for listings, but mentally they're out of the game. They were still recovering from that son of a gun who used them and abused them and bought from that neophyte and never even called them and blah, blah, blah. That's what's going on in their head while they're looking for listings for the new guy. And the fact of the matter is, is they're out of the business because they're feeling sorry for themselves. And I have to say, um, in the end, I had a little bit more than a 1,000 salespeople at the point I sold my business that I had built out over 22 years. But um, the the important thing is, is even though I only had a 1,000 salespeople or so, I had, I had probably hired 8,000 salespeople to get those good ones, mm-hmm. right? And of, so think of that. I probably fired 7,000 salespeople in my career. Now, that's not a happy thing, okay? But I would say the number one reason – in fact, probably nine out of ten reasons why somebody didn't cut it or didn't make it in the field is that feel sorry for you that they took they took insult personally. That's what it was. It's o- it's almost like they didn't conserve energy correctly in their brain. They let it leak through these uh, feeling sorry for themselves or gossip about their old clients who who they thought screwed them and, and so on. They were living in the past. In their brain, they were living in the past, and they were still recovering from an injury. You know, I, um, I always feel that the great salespeople have low IQs. Even my entrepreneurs uh, on Shark Tank that are my most successful, some of them I almost feel like have, if I were to, if I could do an IQ test, which of course I wouldn't do, um, I would think that they'd be average IQ type people. But what they know how to do is they're like a uh, great, great visual that's come in my head here is it's like a jack in the box. He pops up, you slam him on the head, he goes, oh, hit me again. Is that intelligent? No. But that really is the nature of that kind of a racehorse or jack in the box. Pop up, hit me again. What? Come on, shouldn't you lay low a while? No, they don't. They keep popping up. Uh, it doesn't mean they don't take the injury, but it's just a quicker turnaround time, real quick turnaround time. I love that jack in the box analogy, actually, because it's really true. The jack in the box is pops right back up, is happy, and you want to hit it again. You got it, right? So, so let's talk about your obstacles, though, because you started this business kind of in the early 70s. And in, in the 70s, New York City essentially went bankrupt. I mean, real estate couldn't have been that great. What were your obstacles during these early startup years? Well, my asset was it was a terrible years for New York. You know, we had tremendous problems with crime in the city. People didn't want to live here. Lots of people were moving out. A lot of the corporations moved out. And so I wouldn't say we were like a Detroit in its worst time, but we were not a happy, uh, happy picture. Okay? But um, I didn't know then, but I certainly knew looking back at it only uh, seven or eight years later when New York started coming into its own, that I had the luckiest time of any kid in the world because I just happened to land in New York in its darkest hour. And what do you get? in the bad market that you don't get in a, any good market is you have a, a real openness to newcomers, um, not a lot of direction on how to do it right because nobody's really got the formula. And uh, you can shove the old boy network to the left and to the right and make a space for yourself because they're laying low, especially the established companies in bad times I learned. In hindsight, of course, the established big companies in town I mean, they seemed giant at the time. They had 30 salespeople. I thought they were like IBM or something, right? But they were giants when I had one or two people. And uh, they uh, lay low when they have a reputation. They have an attorney, which I couldn't afford. They have a, a system to speak to their team. They have a vetting process. 
Uh, and so as a result, the prudent thing when times are bad is to just maintain. Whereas when you're the new kid on the block, you don't know it's a bad time and you have nothing to lose and nowhere to go but up. How free are you? You could try anything. You're not going to ruin a reputation on one in the first place. And so I found that I got very lucky. I wondered sometimes if I had started in a hot, terrific market, whether I could have gotten the traction I did. But nobody was watching about me. Nobody cared. And uh, it was open game, really. Open shooting season in a way because New York was so lousy, you know? Do you think in general entrepreneurs should look for uh, kind of lousy markets that were once hot? I, I don't know how to kind of formulize what you just said, it's, but it sounds interesting. Well, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say look for lousy markets, um, but I think what's, what, what is always true, and I learned uh, to recognize it and actually look forward to bad markets, as sick as that was, even though it brought tremendous cash flow problems with it. But um, I think how you use that, uh, or I use that, I should say, I don't know if it's useful to someone else, is I knew when the shit hit the fan, oh, wait, are you allowed us to talk like Yeah, that? yeah, we could say everything. Say it again, you can edit it out if you want to. So when the shit hit the fan, um, I realized that it was game time for me. I realized I was going to have a huge advantage, and that really shored me up quite a bit. So if interest rates, for example, went to 18%, and nobody was buying anything because no one could borrow money, which was certainly a case for about a year and a half in New York. Um, I had one of my best successes in my life. I thought of this one-day loser sale where I priced everything together, uh, you know, all different locations of apartments that uh, insurance company, equitable insurance, couldn't unload. And I came up with a sales gimmick. And the sales gimmick, I honestly was mimicking just a puppy sale my mom had taken me to as a kid. Uh, you know, where, where I, I don't want to get on course. Who cares about the puppy sale? I stole the idea in essence. It wasn't mine. But what I did was I, I care about the puppy sale. What, what happened in the puppy sale? Oh, it was stupid. Um, it was a it was a chicken farmer lady who lived next to my grandfather in southern New Jersey. And even though she didn't have chickens, they called it a chicken farmer lady. And anyway, she was selling Jack Russell puppies. So she had uh, a few Jack Russell puppies. They were always running around trying to bite us. I hate those dogs to this day. Uh, I don't offend anybody. But uh, she had a litter of Jack Russell puppies in a cardboard box. And my mother had to sit down. We had like seven kids at the time. I was old enough to like interpret what was going on. I was one of the older kids. And she had to sit down on the road and watch the people at the puppy sale. And this woman had advertised, I don't know where, but she had all fancy people from New York coming for a Jack Russell puppy. And she only had, I think she had, I can't remember, let's say five Jack Russell puppies. Uh, but she had like 12 city slickers who wanted them. And so even when that last lady who looked like a royal pain in the ass, I can even tell you what she was wearing that day, got that last puppy that even as kids, we knew that puppy was going to be dead within minutes, right? She was so happy because she got the last puppy. But that was an interesting sales lesson. When you don't have enough to go around, people want it, right? Okay. I can't tell. I wish I could tell that faster. Now back to New York the New York version of that. So I took the 88 apartments that Equitable Insurance owned because I did not want a public auction. I didn't want the embarrassment of that. And I priced them all alike. I just took the sale price, high floors, low floors, back apartments, front apartments, view apartments. Some didn't even have kitchens built in. They were in the midst of renovation when they ran out of money. So I priced them all alike, and I secretly gave out the list. One week hence, come early, bring only your best customers, bring only your family if they are really desperate for an apartment. First come, first serve. Pick the best ones. Get there early. And, of course, I had many more than 88 people in line, and I made over a million dollars within the hour. So that was yeah. like – in the worst time, the best, the best profit I ever made. Okay, but what what does it have to do with it being the worst time? Because you could also do that strategy in the best time. It wouldn't work. You know why? Because there's no equitable insurance company who's got a problem to begin with. Everybody was problem ridden with real estate. I see. So, so in the worst times, you have the you have the possibility of structuring the deal the way you want it. Absolutely. And in the worst times, you also have. Um, you have, well, that's it. I was going to say license to kill, but that would be another way of saying structuring the deals how you would like them. Yes, I would agree with you. Well, what about what about the obstacles that that you hit? Because again, you you mentioned how the best salespeople were able to kind of move quickly past rejection and obstacles. How did how did you do it? When did you have a chance to do that to see it in yourself? Oh, you mean in that particular sale? Or? No, no, no. In in general, in in those times, in those early stages, because I think a lot of entrepreneurs fail at this. They let failure bring them down for too long, and they don't survive it. 
Well, then they're not entrepreneurs, really. You know, I don't mean to be so hard on people, but they're really not entrepreneurs because the nature of an entrepreneur is identical, I find, to the nature of a great salesman. And I don't have a single entrepreneur who's successful who isn't a great salesman, by the way.